Um, our Chinese colleagues have been d dwelling on the contents of a 32,000-character Chinese speech. Um, my president only gives me 144-character tweets, so I'm much freer to um, embroider my own thoughts into what I'm about to say. Um, I, I start from an assumption that the, I think, widely shared, but I'd be glad to deal with disputes on this, that we're going through a, a major transition in the role of important powers in the world, that the unipolar uh, post-Cold War era has come to an end, and with the uh, growth and power of China and the more independent courses sought by um, Russia and with Europe sort of left to its own devices, uh, we, we are seeing a, a reemergence of the, the, a structure that would lend itself to a balance of power concept going forward as opposed to the kind of unipolar world we've been uh, living with. That's my hypothesis. And that within that balance of power and concept, I think you know, the, the, the struggles we face in Iraq and Afghanistan and the uh, uh, problems that we have on the Korean Peninsula, I think, are all dwarfed by the larger challenge of how to manage the transition of China to a great power status through uh, increased actual power and influence um, in, a, in a part of the world which is still regionally centered, uh, where the U.S. had, since the end of the uh, for Second World War, essential predominance at sea and, and very strong position, and is now in a position to try to protect its alliances and interests in the region while China's influence and uh, capabilities grow. I think this is the most fundamental uh, challenge we face. How do we make this transition occur as a plus-sum game and not turn into a wasting conflict between the U.S. and China? Um, in the process of the transition from the Obama administration to the Trump administration, you know, Mr. Obama has always been more persuasive than active, and uh, I think he was a little, he overfulfilled his quota in talking to Trump on the importance of the North Korean problem. Uh, the North Korean problem is very serious, and it has an urgency that's been accelerated by the, the young leaders determination to rapidly develop military capabilities of a strategic nature. Um, but I think this is a problem that's got a year and a half, two years, two and a half years to, to play out. And yet, in the world of the Trump administration, it's assumed an urgency that transcends managing great power rivalries, managing the U.S.-China long-term friction, dealing with the various hot spots around the world, and there's been a, a singular focus on it. I think this is misplaced, but that's uh, where it is. And then within that focus on North Korea as the most immediate threat to the U.S., there's been a, a further concentration on the Chinese role in dealing with that. And I have, if you go to think tanks in Washington or offices in the government, I think 95% of the people there would tell you the answer to North Korea is in China. I think that's fundamentally misunderstands North Korea's relationship with China. That's not to say China's not really important. China is a necessary part of dealing with North Korea, but it is not a sufficient element of a policy to deal with North Korea. So at some point, if we're going to reach the, a posture of containment and deterrence over a long period of time, while entertaining the hope that someday we can talk them out of their weapons or talk them into downgrading what they have or limiting what they have, um, we've got to have a fairly realistic policy for um, uh, holding the alliance with South Korea and Japan together, uh, providing adequate protection, signaling the extended deterrence still works. And I think we've got to look at uh, steps that have not yet, largely not have yet been contemplated. For me, there's a five-stage uh, process for dealing with the North Korean problem in the short term, uh, extending in the mid, maybe even in the long term. The first is, of course, to say you're interested in talks because you want to keep a coalition of like-minded countries believing that you are a reasonable leader and you want to have talks if possible. But recognizing that the likelihood of talks and the prospects are not good anytime soon. I say that because I believe on the American side, the sanctions that have been 
uh, imposed by the United Nations and some of the unilateral sanctions that have been additionally imposed have just begun to bite. And there's no reason to assume that North Korea at any time in the next few months is going to feel the pain to the point where it wants to come to the table and sue for a kind of peace. And on turning that around, on the North Korean side, they still have yet to demonstrate a successful re-entry vehicle. They've got some uh, airframe issues, propellant, and uh, other issues to, to work through. So I don't think they're ready to say, hey, we've got the system. You come to the table and talk to us now. We want to freeze this as our new nuclear power status. So I think we've got months, six months, who knows, a year, uh, where neither side really wants to talk about talks until other than for purposes of um, diplomatic salesmanship. So what do we need to do? The second step I would think we need to do, and it's partly being implemented with some complications in the last week, and that is to ramp up what missile defenses we have. We have point, mid-course, and national defense capabilities. Um, the, the point defense in Korea has been partially implemented. The Korean government's now getting a little wobbly on that, but we need to look more into it. Uh, the United States has got a bill that's been through the Senate that will add 28 launchers to our Fort Greeley capabilities in Alaska, which is a significant capability. Um, but missile defense is not even 50% reliable, so we, that's just a necessary first step. The second step, I think, is we've got to start dealing with the, the ramp up of uh, intermediate, range uh, intermediate range missile capabilities in the region which threaten American positions in Kadena and other bases, as well as our allies and friends uh, in South Korea, Japan, American bases in Guam, go down the list. The U.S. is the only country still actively engaged in protecting the INF Treaty. Uh, the Russians have been violating it. The um, Chinese are not a part of it and have been building all sorts of capabilities, and now North Korea is rapidly developing its medium-range capabilities. So I think the U.S. needs to uh, leave the INF Treaty and announce that it's going to be prepared to start putting middle-range missiles into uh, the Northeast Asia. And this is based on the model that we experienced in the 1980s when the Soviet Union put SS-20s into East Europe, Reagan against very strong reactions in the, in the Western European political world, uh, installed Pershing missiles. That worked. It brought to a negotiation the INF Treaty that uh, is, should be prevailing today, but is not. I think it should be the model going forward. In the short term, we probably need capabilities against North Korea that both threaten North Korea in, in a way that's uh, commensurate with the threat they're posing, um, sends a signal to China, it also reinforces deterrence as an uh, extended deterrence for our allies in Japan and Korea. The fourth area I would look at is uh, reintroduction of tactical nuclear weapons on American vessels uh, in the region. The, um, the temptation to go nuclear for Seoul and Tokyo is there. I doubt either government in the full consideration of policy and strategic concerns would go that route, but the ability of the United States to provide that kind of deterrence, I think, would help to tamp down the temptation to go on a nuclear path for those two countries, reassure the turns, and help prevent the North Koreans from, as they develop their long-range capability to threaten the United States, from being able to then turn to the South Koreans and say, what have you got? Americans are going to be held at bay because we can put a pistol or a missile to their heads, and so that's an important part of that. The, the next component, I think, that we really need to ramp up is a, a covert action against North Korea. And uh, here we've been spending about $7 million a year on, on uh, plug-in computer parts and telephones and things. Uh, and there's been a little bit of additional uh, cyber activity, but again, on the 1980s model, when Ronald Reagan went after Eastern Europe, the resources poured into covert action into East Europe were fed far more significant as a share of spending. I'm not saying we're going to use the same methods on North Korea. The situations are entirely different. But I think I'm advocating a scale of effort on covert action against North Korea that uh, is commensurate with the challenge that we face from them. Now, uh, a lot of this will be, um, will burn the ears of people who hear it or think the Americans are getting a, a belligerent. But I think, uh, one, the threats we face do require extraordinary measures. And two, uh, if we get to a point and this is hypothetical, 
that the North Koreans are willing to talk to us and other parties about capping, downgrading, whatever it is. Um, we need something to bargain with. And certainly the United States is not going to bargain with the North Dakota missile fields against North Korea. So we have, I think we would be putting chips on the table that may or, not, may or may not prove useful in a bargaining setting, but certainly prove useful in a deterrence and reassurance setting. Now, is this enough? I don't think so. I think this is, uh, these are temporary and short-term kinds of measures dealing with a very contemporary problem. But I want to get back to the, the big challenges. How do we manage our uh, long-term rivalry with China and keep it from becoming a wasting struggle. And here I think we need to burst out, of, burst out conceptually from where we are. The administration, as far as I can tell, they've been extraordinarily inarticulate, both in describing what they're up to with allies and with people like me and who visit with the government in Washington uh, on this new Indo-Pacific strategy, which looks very much like a, a warmed over John Howard, uh, Koizumi, George W. Bush approach to trying to struggle to have some conceptual counter counterpart to what uh, China was shaping up to be back in the, the first decade of the 21st century. I think China's you know, continued to develop influence in the speeches prior to this uh, dealt with some of the, the ambitions that China has. Some of these ambitions fall into the category that Bob Zelik described 10 years ago as trying to t turn China into a responsible stakeholder. And I think China is now, for the first time, kind of welcoming that role, but not using those terms. And we want to shape that. We want to try to grab as much of that and diminish as much of the threat side of that as we can. And I think conceptually, we ought to take a departure from this so-called Indo-Pacific strategy, which is really a, an effort to put some kind of muscle into uh, Barack Obama's <coughs> pivot to Asia or rebalance to Asia. For me, that was an, an example of NATO in the old-fashioned joke term, no action, talk only. The U.S. never really did anything in the pivot. And in fact, the pivot provided pretext for the Chinese to do some things which they thought were countering what the U.S. was doing. And we ended up uh, in a net deficit in our position <coughs> in the Asia-Pacific region. Certainly, the South China, sea, South, China, South China Sea would be a very good example of that. So just a quick cut to the chase, I think the United States ought to be coming forward with a, a, a policy of co-optation of China's new desire to be a more responsible stakeholder in the world. And we ought to be adjusting our positions instead of opposing, literally opposing the Belt and Road Initiative as a threat to us, or as in the Obama administration, opposing the formation of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Not only would it be cutting our losses since we uniquely oppose the AIIB, and the, I think the, the count now is 57 countries to one against us on that one. Uh, but more importantly, to try to refresh the Bretton Woods instruments and bring them up to date, where it was originally based on the victors in World War II, and then the G7 sort of had a, a bigger role, and the ADB was added over time. I think it's time for another round of re-examination of the Bretton Woods institutions so that they're more representative of the country's shares of GDP around the world. G20 might be the basis for that model of re-examining it. And we want to try to draw China to agree, and others to agree, that the, AD, the um, Asia Investment Bank and the Belt and Road Initiative should properly be brought into the values systems that we have under the Bretton Woods system and where we can learn lessons from the mistakes of the past as AIIB has done in breaking away from some of the rigidities of the World Bank loan approval programs and things or, or board running uh, mechanisms. Um, take lessons from that, try to update that. We ought to also have concepts of regional security. Asia is not a place that's ripe for a, a comprehensive regional security mechanism because of the various characteristics of the states and historical rivalries. But there are constant impulses to try to find regional security mechanisms, regional security values. I think the U.S. really needs to be much more vocal in putting for our values and our allies' values in trying to identify what we want to achieve 
with regional security proposals uh, and tackle specific problems, and North Korea would be one, South China Sea would be another. And then there are subordinate ideas that can be brought in this broad package of uh, initiatives. Um, for example, the South China Sea, the, uh, the, the counterclaims have let in the South China Sea have led to excessive fishing there. Uh, China has been consuming the fish everywhere that it can because it has a growing middle class with a high appetite for marine proteins. Uh, other countries are pillaging what they can, when they can. We don't even know what the scientific basis for fisheries on the coast of the of east uh, of Asia is. And we could put together a multilateral uh, effort to one, establish a scientific basis and then see where that takes us in terms of how to sustain species and then where that takes us in terms of working out quotas for various countries. And this is a way of taking away the fuel for the disputes on territory that will be almost impossible to resolve in the absence of a conflict. So I think we need ideas at macro level and down to the micro level that are much more positive in addressing the challenge that China, China presents to the long-term American presence in the region. Thank you.